comments guy. And we're live. There we go. It took a second, but we figured it out. Good day, Whiskey Brothers and Sisters. We're honored to have you, the viewer, and our panel with us here tonight. My name is Dalton. I'm the president of the Alberta Scott Society and founder of the Whiskey Book Club, and I am your host tonight. For those of you that are new, I'm going to explain a little bit about what we are. We're a group of whiskey geeks that love to share a dram, one of these, and share our passion for reading and mostly about whiskey or whiskey-related activities. So our present home, our third book, was inspired initially by our sense of adventure and my long-held desire to do the whiskey trail in Scotland or the bourbon trail with our friends down south. Canada has so much history, so much whiskey. Why not do our own whiskey bourbon trail, a Canadian whiskey journey? It's based on this guy. It helps us out. It's great. So... Thanks to Blair and Davin's tour guide book. It's got lots of pictures, which is really good for me because I'm a visual guy. Tons of maps, directions, suggestions, checklists. We have the direction we need because of this book. We've got the inside track on the distilleries that we want to go see, just like Brock's at Patent 5 tonight. So Davin and Blair will indeed be our spirits guides on this journey as we cross this vast, beautiful country of ours. When we're done, though, after our first hour, we're going to stick around. Ten minutes after we log off, we're going to come back to our more relaxed atmosphere, and it's called the after drown. So please stick around for that. What we're going to do, gentlemen, is we're going to start our roundtable introductions with our names, other platform handles, as well as what you have prepared for our highlighted dram tonight. Patent 5, malted corn, no, wheat and barley whiskey. Uh, we'll start with Davin, Blair, and then we'll go on to Brock and then Dave and myself, if that's all right, everybody. Are we ready? We're ready. Hi. Hi, I'm Davin de Kergamo. Uh, with, along with Blair, I uh, wrote this book, The Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries, which we're following across Canada. You can find me on social media at Davin, D-E-K, D-A-V-I-N-D-E-K. And tonight, I am uh, I was hoping I could drink some whiskey spirit from Patent 5, but, you know, Brock gave me uh, some samples, and that one in a glass bottle got broken. So I'm oh. drinking Patent I'm dr I know I'm drinking Patent 5 awesome gin tonight. Thank you very much, Brock. You're very welcome. <laughs> Hi, Blair Phillips, co-author of The Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries. I am drinking uh, some Patent 5... Uh, Manitoba Berry Gin, mm. and I also have the uh, the um, the sample of uh, the one year old whiskey, well on its way to becoming an official release. Right away, and Brock. Uh, hello, I'm Brock Coots. I'm one of the owners of Patent Five Distillery here in Winnipeg, and you can find us at at patent five distillery on instagram and i'm very much looking forward to the next hour and we are looking forward to talking to you sir dave hey guys it's yukon dave coming from his basement again i actually bought the book i've got the patent five whiskey in my glass along with the gin so oh. let's have some fun you're already ready for the next hour you are really ahead of the game Oh. And then, ladies and gentlemen, there's me. And again, there's the book. I'm Dolph. I'll say it again. President of the Alberta Scott Study. We made this the Whiskey Book Club. We love it. We're in our, this is our seventh, so 7, 14, 19th week, oh. I think, of doing this. Third book. We're doing well. We're enjoying ourselves. We're having fun with this. And tonight, tonight, we're here with Pat and Five. And I'm going to start. And well, I'm going to start by telling you what I'm drinking, and it's 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 straight, and it's the patent five, and I want to give you a little bit of a a view of what we have right there. So whiskey, distilled October 25, 62 and a half percent. Char number three, first year, 62 percent wheat, 38 percent malted barley, and bottled 2020 at cast strength. This is a it's a big one. It's a big guy. And I want you to see the label, too, because these are beautiful bottles. So you should actually get a pretty good look at these guys. Nice bottles. All right. Beautiful, Brock. It is. It's a Thank nice looking bottle. Uh, so I'm going to start with a little bit of background information. And it's based on the first two items that I was able to find on 
your website. So I just need to get a couple pictures up here. And let's let's do this. Here's my first map because we always say we're coming from one distillery to another. So last mountain in Regina, that's where we were. Let's take the number one. And six hours later, going through Brandon, Portage la Prairie, and getting there in Winnipeg, Patton Five Distillery. So that that was our trip. And this is what it looks like. A little bit of information for you. So in the year of 1869, Great Britain's commissioners patents granted 204 patents to the Dominion of Canada. The fifth patent on that list was the following. A certain new and useful art of distilling whiskey. Shouldn't have an E, but it does. By means of which a great increase in quality is obtained from a given quantity of grain. Thus, our name becomes Patent five. So I love the history kind of linked to it. And here's the second part of the history I like. So patent five distilleries located in the Exchange District, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and the Dominion Express building. It was built in 1903. This building originally housed the horses of the Canadian Northern Carthage and express operations of both railroads. The building was designed by the same architectural company that designed Union Station in Winnipeg and Grand Central Station in New York City. So I want to know if I could. Who is the whiskey? Uh, the whiskey buff. Who is the history buff that got all this information? Right. That's me. Um, right. One of the things when you start a distillery is you have to be fairly patient with the authorities having jurisdiction and making their decisions uh, to allow you to open a distillery. So while that happens, you have a lot of time to continue your research. Uh, our goal was always to celebrate Manitoba history. Good. And um, when we, so we had, we had wrestled with a bunch of different names. One of the names we on was Blue Stem Distillery. Blue Stem was the grass that would have been the native prairie grass at the time when the settlers came to Manitoba. And um, as it turned out, there was a bunch of other, there was a blue stem dog food and blue stem condo. So we kept looking. And one of those nights where I was doing my research, I think the Google search was uh, Canadian whiskey history or patent or equipment or something. And up popped a link to the Canadian government archive of patents. Okay. And the turns out patent was this interesting story about a guy by the name of James Wilson who had emigrated from Scotland to St. Catharines, Ontario. And I thought, that's an interesting, patent five is interesting. And I told one of my business partners and they were like, that's the name. And that's how we became patent five. It took off from there. Perfect. Yeah. And I like the history. Well, I'm a history guy and Davin knows that because it, well, his first book is all history and we loved it so much. So I love the link that we're doing here and we're going to continue with the link for this one. And uh, Brock, I'm sorry, this is a really long question. I, a lot of my questions kind of develop into this. So here we go. A CBC article stated the building on the edge of the exchange district was completed in 1904. So that's you. When Winnipeg was still experiencing rapid railway fueled growth and bars and body houses infinitely outnumbered churches in what was then a debauched boom town i like that a lot <laughs> the history of this area is awesome said coots who studied chemistry brewed beer at home and ran a granite supply business before he and several partners invested almost one million dollars in the distillery so here's two-part question well no one for you you see to be like Eau Claire and other distilleries who are embracing this side of history. And I'm just going to, a couple pictures that go with this kind of the, the debauchery. The, I love this giggle water and patent five tomorrow. We're traveling back in time. So you have a link to it. And then even on your site, we've got this. So welcome to the new St. Regis hotel where you got the information. So a lot of history going on through your doors and, and you focus on it. And I'm going to talk about this guy in a second, actually. I shouldn't put that on yet. So uh, why does this period speak to you? Or is it just really interesting, all the sidebar stuff going on in the streets, all the brothels? They didn't talk about the brothels here, but Eau Claire, we talked about the brothels and all the 
the illegal stuff going on, I think is really interesting. And Davin touched on it a lot in his, in his first tone that we talked about as well. And Davin and Blair's one of their best stories is them going to the Maritimes and pouring a dram over the grave of a, is it a smuggler or do we call him a pirate? Well, that was in Ontario. That was no, Ontario? Sorry, that was New no, Brunswick. You're right. That was New Brunswick. Oh, he, man. Was, yeah. he was an entrepreneur. Okay. <laughs> he was an, yes, he was. So my question is for you, going back, does this period really speak to you, Brock? Well, yeah. What I mean, um, Winnipeg, that was sort of Winnipeg's a golden era, if you will, was in the early 1900s. And I don't know if you've ever been to the Exchange District. It's actually a national historic site. Uh, it's predominantly three-story warehouses because, as you said, the, the railways were bringing goods to Winnipeg. We're just a half a block up from the Alexander Docks. Uh, so even predating the, the railway was the, the paddle wheel, the boat traffic up and down the Red River from, from the U.S. into Winnipeg. And then from northern Manitoba, they brought a lot of fish in. There's a historic old fish processing building at the end of our street. So... Winnipeg really, like its downtown core is where we want it to be. Okay. And the exchange district was built. All these warehouses were built at the turn of the century. And so it, it, it was the place we wanted to be. The problem is a lot of these warehouses had their predominantly massive fur beams. And uh, the city sort of let us know that they were quite concerned about the fire hazards associated with that. So when we first found this building... This was built shortly after some major fires in Winnipeg in the early 1900s. And so the architect's challenge was to make this building fireproof. So there is no wood. There was no wood when this building was built. It's brick walls and concrete and I-beam ceilings. Um, so, you know, when we looked at it, it was like, this is the first building that we've seen in the exchange district in two and a half years that looks like it has potential. So it just, it just, felt right. It was, I don't know if you want to get into the history a little bit, but it was built by the Dominion Express Company, as you said, in 1904. And it was at the time Canada's most modern warehouse. So Winnipeg was even ahead of Montreal and Toronto in terms of the amount of electrification through the city. So the horses came in through these two big wooden doors. They uh, unhooked the wagons. The wagons stayed on the main floor and the horses went up... Um, went up a concrete ramp and they they were stabled on the second floor. So the, the building's simple but beautiful. Oh, it sounds quite cool. And I, I tried to have a picture where I could get multiple levels of your building so you could explain where the or how the horses went up. Oh, okay. Or I don't know if there's still something that's around on a wall maybe where you would tear it down where you would have had the ramp. Can there you is. They're still, scar they're still scarring on the wall from where the, where the old concrete ramp was, yeah. I would like that. I would have really, really liked that. So well, you'll uh, have to come out sometime. I will have to go out there. And it's only a couple hours away as per the map that I just put up. Uh, yeah. Devin and Blair, gentlemen, have, can you think of other distilleries? I know we have them in Canada. And I'm thinking in Ontario and maybe Maritimes where there's a lot of history related to it. So where they house, they're in a historical building or they've taken in a lot of historical artifacts and they use it in the distillery or the showroom. Can you think of some? I can think of two in Toronto. Um, we have uh, in the distillery district, uh, Mill Street Brewery opened a distillery there. And that's the old Gooderham and Wars building. Um, and uh, Spirit of York also just down the, the cobblestone path from there is another place that uh, it's very historical looking. Um, besides that, uh, Willibald's uh, near Kitchener, they, they took a, uh, an old barn and, and, and took, like we talk about uh, Patent 5, how they have pieces from a hotel and they refurbished it. Yeah. Um, the, the, Willibald's has the same thing with the whole farming community and they had, they had a, a cattle barn that they, uh, borrowed a lot of wood off of and, and really spruce the place up. <laughs> nice. And let's get to Devin. Devin, can you think of any? Well, you know, I think Phillips. Phillips, uh, you know, brewing and distilling and malting yeah. in Victoria, B.C. They, uh, their pot still, they, it was kind of a mystery where it came from. And um, I'm 
proud to say I'm the guy who solved that mystery. Hey. That, pot, that pot still came from the old uh, Canadian Club Distillery in uh, Wood Lake uh, in the Okanagan. Now, Can Canadian Club it was so massively huge that they built a second distillery. You know, they built Hiram Walker, but they built then they built they built a second distillery in the Okanagan, and they had two pot stills in there. Actually, they had four pot stills in there, and they were using those to make malt whiskey, which was going to Japan and being being used to make Japanese whiskey. And they they when they closed down, when they lost the, the contract with Suntory, they closed down. They, those stills went into various people's garages and things like that. And one of them is now at Phillips, and it's called Old George. And um, the other place I'd have to say is the uh, just 100 uh, Ks from, from where Brock is right now. The, the Gimli Distillery has the original uh, uh, coffee still that came out of the Waterloo Distillery in, in Waterloo. It was one of Seagram's old stills, I think, before the Bronfins even got involved. So, yeah, uh, these things last forever. People do do recycle them. And there's a beautiful old distillery in, inside Black Velvet, a beautiful old still inside Black Velvet, an old uh, 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 gin still, massive big gin still in there. I think they're using it to make uh, high wines now. But, uh, yeah, so and others have done it. it. Pardon me? And where'd they get that, Devin? They got that from the Gilby Distillery in Toronto. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Gavin. Yeah. How, how big was that uh, still that came out of BC to Victoria? I can't, I can't remember. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember. It, it's large, but it's not massive. Okay. Right. I mean, it's, uh, it's a big. It's what? It's got to be 12 feet tall. Yeah. Oh, wow. 2,600 liters. 2,600 liters. See? Oh, All the information in that um, book. I should have said anything. I should have said uh, you can find the information in this book, <laughs> but I spoiled it. Oh, and do we want to give them the page? We should give them the page at least. Yes, I think they should have oh, a page. Well. So go to page one hundred and fifty-five for 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 this distillery. So if we want to hit the above uh, patent five, you're going to that page there, one fifty-five. All the other ones you could look yourself at one point in time. Brock, I'm going to ask you about your the ownership a little bit. So I had a picture of this gentleman here, and maybe you could tell me who he is in a second. There he is. Nope, that's not him. And right there. Okay. So uh, I'll quote your homepage, and it says, an accountant, engineer, entrepreneur, and pharmacist put their diverse talents together to create a uniquely Manitoban experience. This is quite the diverse group. CBC said, Patent 5 co-owners Brock Coots said he and his partner spent five years looking for the perfect property before the Old Dominion Express Company livery stables came available. So I'm asking you, please, sir, what is your Genesis story? And does it involve this guy that was up here? Uh, well, he was, he was certainly one of my early partners that I talked to about this vision that I had. So I managed to convince him it was a good idea. Um, okay. He is a massive home brewer and winemaker and an engineer. So awesome member of the team. He does actually, he's taken over the bulk of the distilling right now, just because we're, it's just, it's been really difficult to keep up, keep up. The Genesis is, I used to travel a lot for a software company that I worked for or a professional services company. Mm -hmm. And I would always seek out the craft brewers. And one of the craft brewers asked me if I'd been to this building in uh, Boston. And I said, no. And he said, well, you got to go tomorrow. And so I went and I don't even remember the name of it, which is embarrassing, but it was a distillery. Okay. And I had never seen a craft distillery before. And I was just awestruck by how beautiful it was and the magic of, you know, beer, making beer is magic. But this was this even took the magical properties another level further. And so I just sort of filed that as a wow. Like I, I, you know, I love making beer when I made beer, but I don't think I had the passion to say, I'm going to open a brewery. Well, I didn't obviously. <laughs> and, um, and the laws in Manitoba were quite, quite restrictive at the time. So it wasn't even, it wasn't even possible. And then about eight years ago, they made some law changes and it became reasonable to attempt. So 
I sort of, it was probably about eight years ago that I started writing the first business plan, put it together, ran it through my friends and, you know, the, the pharmacist as part of the team is my wife. Mm -hmm. And um, it probably took two years of playing with numbers and trying to figure out whether it was a reasonable thing to do. And then finally one day we just said, yeah, let's make it happen. And then that journey started. And then it did. Excellent. Yeah. And we've got four names, I think. So uh, so we've got, is it Dinah or Dina? Yes, either or. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to say Dinah. Yeah. Uh, Mike, Mike, and yourself. Can you help right. me with the ownership structure? Are they investors or are they leadership as well? They, they're just involved in other facets. Um, you know, we all pitch in. So I suspect that you'd say all four are both owners and leaders. Yep. So it's, it's, um, a lot of days everybody pitches in where they can. You are the public face though. I'm pretty sure. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. That's true. It all yeah. comes down on your shoulders. So you always yep, get it does. Good. If something ultimately, if something goes wrong, I'm the guy that has to answer yeah. for it. Explain it all. Perfect. Uh, Devin, um, mm -hmm. talking before we heard you were the one that visited the distillery and Blair interviewed. Is that, am yeah. I on the right? Blair did all the research, yep. uh, and then I uh, went and visited them. I was in town uh, with Mark Kaufman from, you know, the Whiskey Vessel. We, we were doing a show that night, and uh, we went we went over to see Patton 5, and uh, we went to lunch with Mark. I've got to tell you, that Patton 5 distillery is beautiful. There's more history, as we've talked about. Mm. The bar it, that they have, it, like when you walk into the distillery, if you keep going back through this beautiful arch doorway, you get to the distillery and you see the stills and it's beautiful. I've got a picture of it framed through that beautiful door. But if you just turn right, you're in this wonderful cocktail lounge, this bar. It's just, it's it's really something else. And it's all it's all this paneling that they got from the St. Regis Hotel. So yeah, I visited there and I'm telling you, I was really quite uh, quite uh, impressed at, at, at what a what a job they done and, and how much work and they must have put so much money into making that place beautiful. I think that this was just rated as one of the top bars in Canada, if I remember. And this in Winnipeg, so I mean, great. You I mean it's if you're in, it's right in the middle of the country. If you're traveling across Canada, you have to stop into Patent Five for a drink. Brock, I could be wrong. Uh, did you weren't you just awarded as one of the top bars in Canada? Yeah, we were number thirty four. Which uh, the people in the industry that I talked to said it's unheard of for a bar in its first year to make the, even the top hundred. Yeah, nice. Well, I mean, congratulations, just, and thank you. it is beautiful. And you know what? I'm sure if I saw it in person, it would be even more stunning. Oh, yeah, it, it, it is. It, it's really beautiful. So when the Saint Regis was built in Winnipeg, it was it was meant to be sort of the Saint Regis of the North, right? So they modeled a lot of it after the Saint Regis in New York. So, I mean, all of the all of the wood that's in there was hand carved. Well, the pieces that are carved, but all of the wood was made in Chicago in 1911, and then transported up to Winnipeg, and then assembled by hand in the Saint Regis Hotel, which they were going to tear down in 2017 and we were able to, yeah. So those, those, uh, those cherub angels were all hand carved in Chicago in 1911 and shipped up to Winnipeg. So we were just so fortunate to be able to bring all of that back to life in, uh, in the, in our, in our cocktail room. How did you get so lucky to get that? Well, I think anytime there's luck, there's usually a little hard work associated with it. So uh, there's a woman named Cindy Tugwell, who's the executive director of Heritage Winnipeg. Oh. And she was lambasting the city of Winnipeg on the front page one day about how they were going to just knock the St. Regis Hotel down and everything was going to the landfill. And she was bemoaning the fact that this this oak that was a hunt over 100 years old was ending up in the landfill. So I called her. We didn't even have our lease yet. We were still working on that building. And I said, you know, I don't know if this is going to fit, but we're looking at this beautiful historic building that was built in 1904. I mean, I hadn't seen the St. Regis Hotel other than pictures. And she said, no, somebody's taken it lock, stock and barrel and they're going to transform a new, a new oak room is what the room was called. Oh, but I persisted. And after about nine weeks, the deal fell through. And she got us the key and we worked out the details and we went into this place that had 
the basement had flooded, the power was off, there was the whole place was full of mold, so it was full of respirators and you know the the coal miner light on your head, and we went in and started retrieving what we could. It was, but the first time we saw it was on a Friday, and then she called Monday and said, "Okay, you have one week." And when we saw it that Friday, we just we could almost envision what it, we could. We saw it was spectacular and had all sorts of potential, and I mean. Thanks to our our mill worker Vic from Torvik Woodwork, he he treated like that project like he was redoing his own house. It was he's done a magnificent job. It is. So, yeah. Can I ask a question here? Is did you get the front bar out of there and the back bar also, or did those? It, it was the bars had the bars didn't the bars had been repurposed a number of times. This this room was the oak room, so it was more the dining room. Okay. Uh, that those big, beautiful oak headers were actually, that was a top 10 foot stained glass doors that separated the kitchen from the dining area. So that's how opulent this place when it was built was that those, and those sliding doors were over a hundred years old and you could still slide them with one finger. Ooh. That's how well built they were. They were built in 16 inch brick walls. It was a pocket door. So, I mean, it was, it was impossible to get it out, but uh once we did it it just it took shape with our designer it took shape over a period of six months and yeah almost everybody that walks in says it has sort of a turn of the century bar feel or a speakeasy or it doesn't feel like you're in winnipeg but yeah the the feedback's been really positive yeah, it feels like it's been there for a long time you know, Davin, a lot of people walk in and say, you're so lucky to have walked into a place that's so well preserved. And if they had seen it when we got it, it was essentially where the, our landlord stored all the junk, right? The old bathtubs and the windows. And uh, we were lucky, but uh -huh. it took a lot of work to get where it ended up. It's good to be persistent. Yes. Good job. And yeah, I still have to see it. I, I, the more we talk about it, the more I feel like I'm missing out on something. So, yes, oh, we yeah. can all go there and see it. But let's go to the liquid, if we can, <laughs> from the from the physical plant to the liquid plant. Uh, mm -hmm. If we could, tell us, sorry, was it the gin or the vodka that you made first, Brock? It was the vodka. So okay. it... It, it seemed to us that that if we could learn to make good vodka from the research I had done, I don't think good vodka is very easy to make. Um, so we thought if we can make good vodka, then that's going to be a good base for us to understand mashing, fermentation and distillation. So we started with vodka um, and that was pull your hair out for three months trying to figure out how to get exactly what we wanted. And then once we made the vodka, we had been playing with gin recipes for many years before that. So we had a pretty good idea what we wanted to do with the gin. And of course, nothing scales from a uh, 40 liter home still to a larger commercial still. So that took a number of iterations. But, um, but yes, the vodka was first followed as quickly as we could by the gin. And strangely enough, we had already hired our bar staff. So we felt intense pressure to make a that. vodka that was, good, that was going to be good enough to serve in the bar. So every time something didn't go well, you ended up sort of working through the night to try to figure out how you're going to make it so that we could bottle it uh, in, a, in a quality where we would have been happy serving it in the bar. Excellent. And uh, who was the initial distiller then? Was that you creating yeah. it? Or yeah, that was. And what was your wife's job? She was a she was a pharmacist at the time, so she was working in pharmacy. So she and had didn't help with the distilling either, or no? She she well from time to time she would, but she had a full time job. So mostly she just had to listen to me talk about what was and wasn't working and all of the frustrations at that point. So well, can I ask a question here? Because I ask this question every like I've only got like one question. So. <laughs> Get her out of the way, Dave. Do it. So, how did you how did you learn to become a distiller? Well, um, are you still learning? <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, <laughs> absolutely still learning. I don't I don't feel like I, I don't like we're not. I would say we're twenty percent of where we hope to be. Right, we're always playing with new things. But 
Um, my undergraduate degree was in chemistry and microbiology. And I, I literally had not used anything that I had studied in 35 years. And as you know, uh, fermentation is microbiology and distillation is chemistry. So when I read about the principles, I, I did go to a, a couple of distilling week long classes to, to learn, um, to learn, but I, I think I was a fairly fast study because I, I had, I had some technical background. And you had and, something to play with at the same time, I think, right? Sorry? You had the physical thing to play with. You you had the still to play with at the same time. Yes, right? exactly. It, was, it wasn't just theoretical. It was theoretical and you're putting it into practice right, right. away. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But. No, that's fine. But, but it is, it was, you know, sometimes when you read about uh, the whole process of mashing fermentation and distillation, it seems quite simple. And I think there's probably some people, home distillers who try it once or twice, it works, they make a good product, but that's not, that was not our experience. I think we probably hit every roadblock that we could have had. And then because, you know, we started in November when the distillery was really cold and then in April it started to get warm. So anyway, it, I'm sure it's the challenges that every distiller faces, but it was very frustrating, but, uh, but also very rewarding when you, when the drips out of the still are what you want them to be. Yeah. That sounds great. <laughs> and very creative. I love that component of it. Uh, Blair, I'm going to get back to you for a second because we said that you interviewed Brock. Tell me about, because we haven't talked about that process. We just say you've interviewed or you phoned, you got the information. How do you actually get someone's attention, especially when they're stressed out about opening up a new distillery and everything <laughs> going on to try to nail them down and get the information? What do you do? Do, do, you, do you do it online? Is it a telephone call? Are you oh, Skyping? Yeah, no, no, no. This time uh, with, with working with Brock, we, it was all over the phone. But uh, I, I think we bounced emails back and forth just, like, just trying to find a good time to talk because they were so swamped with um, – it was literally as they were trying to open the doors, like they were uh, preparing the room, trying to bottle spirits and all kinds of stuff. So I was, I was being a real nuisance um, and being really persistent. And uh, eventually we just hooked up for maybe half an hour and, and uh, talked about the place. And what kind of questions are you kind of posing, Rock? Are, same type of questions we're saying today, or do you... yeah, I think so. We we really we really talked a lot about the history uh, of the building. Um, talked a lot about the history of Winnipeg distilling from back in the eighteen hundreds. Okay. And uh, at the time, we we did get into talking about whiskey because uh, it it is going to be a whiskey distillery, and we were talking about gin. Um, yeah, it, it was it was a bit blind because at the time um, it was brand new, so. So it, it was kind of odd. You're trying to uh, picture what it's going to be like in three years, four years, five years. And uh, that was the big challenge. Thank you, sir. And, well, we should put this out. We, we've, we've talked about the gin a couple of times. So there's the gin, another beautiful bottle. I like the design, Brock. I'm not sure who's uh, who kind of in charge of these ones, but I really do like the design of the bottles. They're, they're sharp. If, but, Blair, you let me into if my... If you have a couple of minutes, I can tell you. Sorry, yeah. I can tell you a little bit about the oh, label if you like too. So there's a fellow by the name of uh, Shy Smarden who was a graphic designer with EA Sports. Um, and But his passion lied in in design, not in, in game development. So we sort of, I wrote about a 10 page story about who we were and where we were going and basically what we wanted the, the patent five to look like. And he came back with mood boards and we iterated it. And if you look at that label, I don't have a bottle with me, but that's, that's my bad, but the outline. So if you look closely at that bottle, those are sections of land in Manitoba that you see highlighted there. The outline of the label is a dried riverbed, the riverbed that dried up in the early 1900s, that little curvature where the label meets at the back Yep. That's the that's the shape of the Red River right at the end of Alexander oh. Avenue where where we are, um, and there's there's interesting stories about the 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 sections of land in Manitoba was part of a Dominion land survey which was conducted 
in the late 1800s by the Canadian government because they're sending all these settlers west. But they didn't, I mean, you can't just tell everybody it's 50 paces past the big oak tree. So they had to <laughs> delineate the land. And that Dominion Lar Land Survey is still the largest land survey ever conducted. It was Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. Okay. And when they were in Manitoba, they were told not to uh, survey the, the land of the Indigenous people, but they, they were told to survey the land of the Métis people. And the surveyors brought out their steel chain to measure one of the properties. And one of Louis Riel's uh, lieutenants stepped on the chain. And that was essentially the start of the Red River Rebellion. Oh, so, I mean, that story I didn't even know about till we did more research on the Dominion oh. Land Survey and why these, you know, why these sections of land don't don't line up because... There was uh, 1,300 surveyors, and some of them started in the north, some of them in the south. And, you know, when you had to cross a river, you weren't always lining up with the guys coming from the north at the same point. So sometimes those correction lines were quite large. And they just, you know, drew a correction line and, and off they went. So anyway, our, our story, our label has an interesting story, too. That's a fantastic story. Um how would surveyors at that point would how would have they been educated like I, it's it's i'm going on sorry i'm just throwing that question out but we're not going to talk about it because we're going to talk about whiskey i'm sorry <laughs> we're, we're doing history and but but we're i digress back to whiskey uh i'm going to put this quote on because uh right here if we could read that so Blair alluded to this, that whiskey was your plan in the first place. And was it your, your ultimate plan to produce whiskey? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And why, why corn-based? Uh, you know, when, one of the distilling classes that I took was uh, in South Carolina, and they must have had 300 different whiskeys that you could sort of taste and they talked about what they were making the distillery was called i think it was six and 20 and they made a, a beautiful a beautiful bourbon and i love the sweetness of the corn so okay. at manitoba it, i mean we produce a lot of corn and a heck of a lot of it ends up producing is used in uh, in the production uh, up north at diageo's facility to produce crown royal so we have great corn uh, we also have, I mean, Manitoba was founded on wheat. If we, I'll just quickly, a, a quick tangent, Radiger and Herb, which was the last distillery that made whiskey in Manitoba between 1876 and 1880, they made a wheat whiskey and they closed their doors because in 1880, by the 1880s, the Europeans had discovered this red spring wheat in Manitoba, this hard wheat, and it made fantastic bread and cookies. Okay. And they were able to mill it in Manitoba or in, in the prairies and ship it to Europe. And the price skyrocketed and Radiger and Herb just closed their doors. They, they couldn't uh -huh. afford to make whiskey out of wheat anymore. So we thought if our whiskey, if our wheat is that good, we better be making a wheat whiskey. So, yeah. and you know, that was, that quote was probably three or four mm -hmm. years ago. And I think we were still playing with where we wanted to go. We still are playing with where we wanted to go, but um, I like the softness and sweetness of wheat. I like the sweetness of bourbon. I like the, the backbone and the structure and the flavor that, uh, that barley provides. So we're still finding our way. I would say that it's probably going to be a few more years before we say, okay, that's, that's our signature whiskey. And, you know, we're going to make, uh, thousands and thousands of barrels of it and push Diageo out and start using their warehouse to store our whiskey. I'm just kidding. So for a grand plan, we figured out what our what our signature whiskey is. We're playing with, you know, different aging techniques and and different mash bills, and it's you know you talked about experimentation. That's that's so much fun. Uh, pulling it off the still at different proofs, and yeah, it's lots of fun. Okay, well, this is another quote. I don't like whiskey that you have to let sit for a long time to air out, and you sort of wince when you take your first sip. It should be a Beautifully smooth whiskey from the first sip to the end. And and you still agree with that comment? That, that's, that's still what you're going for? That's my personal preference. If in the end we make a whiskey that people don't like, I'll, I'm certainly open to change that. But that's our goal 
is something that, you know, the first sip you're going to say, wow, I'm, you know, I'm picking up a little banana or a little vanilla and it just, it's, it's soft enough, maybe not at cask strength, but it's soft enough that you're, you're going to enjoy the first sip. You know, you don't need to let a big ice cube melt a little bit. All right. Anyway, it's more of a philosophical opinion about how, how we want our whiskey to taste. Which you're allowed to have. You're creating. Yeah, you are allowed. You yeah. Devin, do you agree? Is that oh, man. You I, I, yes. He just said it much more eloquently than I did. And Brock, when Blair and I come to Winnipeg, you and I, well, the three of us have got to sit down. Maybe that restaurant around the corner where we went for lunch. Yep. Not with whiskey, with a, with beers. And we have to talk history because you've got some wonderfully great information. But I want to know where this herb guy came from. He's Wait. not from Kitchener, is he? Herb? You said there was a distiller by the name of Herb. Uh, no, this guy. This guy was. Um, what was his name again? Uh, J the the guy that emigrated from Scotland. You mean? No, the guy who you had a distiller that was making wheat. You there were two people. Who yeah. were oh, in that sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This this was in South Carolina. Uh, oh, South Carolina. Okay. Never, yeah, okay. yeah. 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 No. no but, well, I think you need to go back to 1880s is where those guys closed their door because the, the wheat got too, too expensive. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Radiger and herb. Yeah. So, oh. so I've tried to do some history on those two gentlemen, but it turns out they, they don't have a lineage in Winnipeg. Cause I thought, you oh. know, maybe one day I'm going to knock on a door of, of one of these great, 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 great grandsons of Mr. Herb. And he's going to say, Oh, I've got this marvelous whiskey recipe for you. So it didn't happen that way, but yeah, they, that's what they made their whiskey from in 1880 was wheat. And we tried to figure out like they wouldn't have had access to enzymes at the time. So he clearly would have had some malted barley or he would have had the enzymatic activity coming from somewhere. So we we don't know yet where that yeah. where that came from. We can only guess. Maybe use Brock. I should. Uh, 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 Brock, I'll have to send you. I have uh, Herb's uh, obituary from 1930s. Oh. And uh, he gets. They, they really talk about the distillery in, in a short section, um, and he attributes it just like you said. He was he was complaining about um, the price of wheat killing them, but it was also uh, 1880 was about the time that the railroad came through Winnipeg. And um, that was the secondary factor that uh, that made them close. And um, oh, I didn't know that. I, I knew the railway changed the the course of Winnipeg uh, significantly, but I didn't know that had a hand in it. They did. They did move over, so they were on a little street called Distillery Avenue that ran off of what is now Higgins, which is about less than a kilometer from where we are. And then they moved on to Main Street, and they still sold spirits, but they just didn't make it anymore. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I'd love that, Blair, if you could send that. Uh, I'll, email, I'll, I'll send that to you, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Brock, are you uh, are you distilling what you envisioned? Um, yeah, pretty close. I, I think I had in my mind that um, at this point, we already would have tried rum and some brandy and, you know, maybe two or three other things. But it's it's hard to make good spirits. It's not like you just throw a bunch of molasses, uh, <laughs> you know, in a heat it up and ferment it and distill it, and magically you get good product. So it's been slower than I would have liked. Um, so you know, you just have to change your business plan a bit. And you know, I'd hope that we're you know our oldest whiskey's been over a year, and you know, it's it's not ready to release. I didn't think it would be, but it's it's hard to know what today's whiskey is going to taste like in three years, and that's 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 one of the big frustrations I think with distilling, but also part of the excitement too. Every time you go to the barrel, every few months you get you know you get usually get rewarded with what age has done to your whiskey. Okay. I think this is a year old, right? Uh, that one is not quite. I think it was it was October ish, wasn't it? This that that one. This is a great start. October Thanks. to July. Yeah. yeah. So October, November, December. So we're about nine months. ten month, nine or ten months in. Yeah. Yeah. Delicious. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Thanks. Yeah. 
And uh, we'll we'll taste this in a second. I just want to get one more question out of the way before we do this. And uh, Brock, it's about procuring procuring local ingredients. Yeah. Now, did you have to do that by some type of pro provincial law or policy like they do in BC? And no. I found something the NDP government initiation of 2014, but I don't know if it tells you you should be using Manitoba produce or not. They, they, no, it, it, um, that was mostly a craft brewing strategy that they created. The, okay. the craft, I'll call it the craft manufacturing, because there's, there's now cider, a cidery, a meadery, a winery, and a distillery in Winnipeg. So those, the other craft manufacturers, it was left kind of half baked at the time. So it was, it was just our always part of our philosophy that if we are going to be a proud Manitoban company, and celebrate the history of Manitoba and celebrate Manitoba on our label, we are absolutely going to use Manitoba ingredients. So the only thing we can't, so our wheat is all grown and milled in Manitoba. Um, we can tell you exactly where our corn came from for our whiskey. The only thing is there is still uh, no small enough malter in Manitoba for us to be guaranteed that our malted barley was grown in and malted in Manitoba. Um, they tell us it's likely about 50% Saskatchewan, 50% Manitoban. So uh, it was it was just always our principle. We we forage for junipers and I grow coriander and we've got, you know, our, our Manitoba berry gin is made with Manitoba Saskatoon. So when I looked at some of the distilleries that I that I really admire the way they do it. They're just all about how can we express uh, uh, local, you know, and terroir is maybe too strong a word, but how can we express local in what we do? Okay. Well, we could have a discussion about terroir. I like that too. It's, 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 a, it's a topic that not a lot of people want to talk about right now in whiskey. I think, I think it's a fun one though. Uh, I want to show a picture here. I just got it. And if we can look at that. Ah, you good looking guys in there, eh? So, and we see the arcway, which is gigantic. Did you tell us the height? Is that 12 feet high? They're 10 oh. feet doors. Holy yeah. cow. And, and, and if you could another. actually look closely at them, about two feet up from the bottom, they're, they're very worn. And that's from the serving oh. staff pushing the cart for a hundred years back and forth between the serving area and the kitchen. Yeah, there it is. That's look that. at that. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you, Gavin. thank you very much. But My pleasure. <laughs> uh, if uh, gentlemen, let, let's taste the whiskey in front of us. Let's take this time and I'll, I'll let everyone have their say. The only thing I'm saying first is, is uh, raisins. I've been getting it so heavily and it, it's a good smell, but it, it's, it's raisins and I can't tell the difference between different types of raisins. So if someone can help me out, that'd be good. But uh, Davin Blair, Yukon, Dave, and then Brock will have your comments on it if we could. Sure. So, well, sorry, Davin. All right. No, you can talk about the, the gin, though. I'm drinking this gin, which I find really quite ma mature for, you know, a distillery that's been open for such a short period of time. I really enjoy it. Um, Blair knows that I, I uh, like it a lot of juniper and I would like a little more juniper in this, but I'll bet you a buck. Uh -huh. If Blair was drinking this, he'd be extolling its virtues. You know, <laughs> it, I'll just, uh, on the gin, one thing, well, we do, I think lots of things differently, but we actually don't crush our juniper berries. Oh. Junipers have three little seeds in them and that's where the bitterness now, and, and some people like the bitterness of junipers. Um, so we don't, cr you like the better. Yeah. So that's why you're asking for more juniper. So in a batch that would produce 300 bottles of gin, there are four kilos of junipers. Oh, so wow. if you look at most people's juniper or, or botanical bill, we're really on the high side, but it's because we don't crush any of our botanicals. We put them all in whole. Oh, okay. So, okay. But, but that's interesting that you'd even like the juniper cranked up a little bit more. We're we're we just about have enough junipers to do a Manitoba juniper gin, and I think oh, maybe yeah? what we're going to do on that one is really fill the pot with juniper berries, crush a few and just for me, and crush a few to make <laughs> you happy. Okay. <laughs> All right. 
Blair, what you thinking? Um, I okay. So I was trying the um, the uh, Manitoba Berry Gin, and something yep. I really liked about it was the uh, the texture of the spirit. It's got a really good viscosity, and and I'm I'm detecting that same um, that same character in this uh, in this whiskey is that has a great mouthfeel. Um, I, it's, it's good. Like I, I don't smell any weirdness or funkiness. It's, it's, it's. <laughs> Those are good things, Brock. No weird or funky in my whiskey or gin. Yeah, <laughs> and and the and the, the when I open the bottle, like this little sample bottle, the um the the wheat bready notes just flooded out of it, and and I was thinking like Davin, I think I think you need to find that broken bottle, and put it through a coffee filter or something because it's it's uh, quite exciting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah three of them broke together. That that and two samples from Ampersand smashed against each other, and I've got glass and a wet paper bag. That's very uh, sad. I'll make sure that I pull a sample from that barrel. We initially, when we pulled the sample, we we lined them up and we were gonna we were gonna proof it down. Uh -huh. And I was playing with that and I thought, you know what? This, I'll just send it out at cask strength. I think that's probably where I'm going to get the best feedback on it is just straight up and, um, mm -hmm. and, and see what you think. So I'm, I'm always excited if, and, and I take criticism well, because we, I, like I said, I've got lots to learn. I, I said, I've had, we had somebody taste it and I, I tended to agree that there might still be a little bit of the sort of the tails note hanging in there two months ago, it was fairly strong. And I, you know, I, you said there's no funk Blair. Do you want a little funk in your whiskey or no? I, no, I'm not no, sure. no. You don't. No, I, I'm, I'm just saying that the spirit, you can tell it's good quality and, and the, and I, I don't know if it's the fruity notes that, that um, like that fruity multi note that's in there is coming from the tails, a little bit of tail sneaking through. I don't know. But I don't I don't smell that that weirdness when you okay. uh, when you have too much of, of the of the distillation going late into the cycle. I don't smell that at all. Okay, good, good. Can I ask a quick question here? Uh, Canadian whiskey smith asked us a question for Brock. Are you distilling the botanicals in the pot, in the column, or is there a combination? Are you doing like there's a whole bunch of different ways to do this? But when we you talked about the juniper, but there's got to be a bunch more stuff in there, right? Yep. Yeah. We use 13 botanicals. Okay. And and the citrus and the and the flowers are in a vapor basket. So we do a combination of of boil in the pot and some vapor infusion. Okay. Yeah. So we we played around with different things in the pot. And I for us at least, the roots and the berries did best in the pot uh, during distillation. And the lighter citrusy floral notes for us seem to do better in the uh, in the in a vapor basket in the column, or at the top of the pot actually. So did you did you jockey around with that a little bit? Did you try yes. a couple combinations and then? Yeah, we we kind of from our small still we kind of knew the flavor profile from the botanicals. We've changed those just slightly swapping out star anise and swapping in licorice because star anise just didn't like to play as well as, as licorice did. Um, and then it just, it, the first time we did it this way, plus this was the first time we ran it at about half the speed that we were before that. And the really super slow distillation and the citrus and the floral uh, components in the vapor basket, we've just settled on that. I mean, we continue to tweak it, but the, the botanical profile has changed marginally in the last six months. So you just said something that I got to ask a question here. When you said <laughs> a slow distillation, doesn't things boil at a certain speed? So how do you slow down the distillation? Uh, if you if you add more heat to the pot, you'll get it. The, the You can't change the temperature, but you can change the speed that the distillate comes across. Okay. Yeah. So we distill at about four gallons an hour, which is... Like gin days are really, really long days. So <laughs> some people have said we're crazy and, and maybe it won't scale, but for now it we found that that was the, the right pace for us. Okay. Well, I just never heard that before. And, and I could just, I could just see a still working. I wonder, well, how do you slow it down? How do you speed it up? So. 
Yeah, just just um, we've got a little uh, control on the back of the steam, so we just turn it so that and we just regulate the flow. That's how how we decide if if it's getting enough energy. So does that control work on the employees, or do they go at one? <laughs> <piece>? <laughs> I'm the only person that does the gin so far, so I'll, uh, it's, it's fairly well documented. So we're ready to, I think, transition to let other people attempt it. Okay, Dave, uh, I want to ask you a question. Tell me about the whiskey. What do you smell? What do you like, bud? Who me? Yes. <laughs> you know, I had to look at the bottle a second time because I, I was surprised at the uh, sixty point sixty two point five ABV because. Yeah. When I nosed it, I didn't expect it to be that high because it didn't come across as hot, like 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 really hot. Uh, and it's got a – when you said wheat, I get that nice wheat softness that I really like. But I get a little bit of cinnamon, kind of those cinnamon candy heart things. Oh, yeah. The finish that just, just hangs in there. And I – when I first taste it, I taste that redness out of those cinnamon candies. So – Gavin doesn't, doesn't usually agree with my with my <laughs> with my tasting, but it's what you taste. I'm a bit odd. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I don't think I disagree. I don't think I disagree with you, Dave. Good. Well, you don't have any to challenge me. So. <laughs> no, I mean, in general, in general, I don't think I do. Well, I get I have good days and bad days, and and today I think is a good day. I get mm -hmm. get the nose going. It's all fresh. Yeah. Uh, raisins. I get the uh, uh, caramel. A little bit of caramel on the sweetness yeah. with the raisins. And I, I was expecting vanilla with the high char, but I'm not getting the vanilla with the char number three. I thought I would, but not yet. Maybe in a couple. Well, that's why I asked the question about how old this is, because I'm not getting uh, wood on the finish. No, not yet. And so, yeah, I think this is really cool. Yeah, I, it um it's a it's a challenge because two months ago we actually shifted a little bit about the way we distill because two months ago this whiskey was like oh boy this is it's either going to take a really long time to age or something's not quite right and then i don't think we've i don't think we pulled it out of the barrel until this week when you pulled it out and uh our general manager bartender who's worked in distilleries before is like wow, like those last two months have been really, really kind to it. So <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't know when it's going to be woody, which is my concern, right? Because I, I that's a that's a flavor profile I don't like. So well, we'll probably have to, yeah, yeah, we'll probably have to taste it every, I don't know, couple or three months going forward. I don't, I don't really know. So, so here's, here's the question from Teresa, our Canadian whiskey smith. New oak? <laughs> New oak. Is it, it's all new? It's all, well, sorry, this batch is all new oak. We've, we're, we've got some whiskey aging in uh, some old bourbon barrels, some Heaven Hill barrels that were three and four years old. Um, but this was, this was new oak. Yeah, that okay. was, um, we just thought if we're going to do something different and, you know, I know that there are other people doing it, but that's that was that was our decision is to to do it in new oak yeah so that question now leads to question number two uh what size are the barrels these that one's a 55 gallon good yeah so we do we have a we have a 10 gallon version of that which we thought would give us a little bit of visibility into into how the whiskey was going to age but that's not true that that 10 gallon barrel the it's just, it doesn't even seem like the same whiskey as the stuff that's in the 55 gallon. So okay. that little thought process of using the 10 gallon to sort of say, you know, assuming it aged two or three times as fast, it certainly hasn't worked for us. Well, from what I've, I've talked to other distillers in the States and they say the small barrels give you woodiness, but, and you may pull some color, but for less than a year old, I think he had great color on this one. Yeah, I was I was surprised that it it's a fairly a fairly rich color. Yeah, it's nice. Well, you gentlemen, don't have, you don't have any right. bottles of those for your friends, do you? Don't have any bottles of those uh, this one year old for your friends. I where so <laughs> our goal is when it's released, it will be 
you know, that that's something we could stand behind or proud of, say we're going to make over and over again. And I want people to say, wow, like, I'm glad you waited for as long as it took. The, yep. the local whiskey community is quite excited to have somebody making whiskey in Winnipeg. So I want to make sure when it does come out um, that people are very proud of what we're doing. And we're proud of it as well. And you're Stick legal. Stick to your guns. Stick to your guns, Brock. Thanks, Dan. I'm on your side. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I agree. You only get one chance to people. make a first impression, and people will remember that. Yeah, we're lucky enough that our vodka and gin are doing quite well, so we can afford to be patient with our whiskey. Yeah. Well, and your tasting room should be doing pretty well, too. With uh... It, it right. is. The, the social distancing that, that we have here in Manitoba means our 32 seat cocktail room can accommodate about 20. Oh, so, but okay. you know what? It, people were excited when we reopened at the end of June, people were excited to come back out. And even if it's only 20 people, at least they're, you know, they're still sharing what we're doing. That's quite good compared to us in Edmonton. Most places are 50% here. So you're doing better than that. Oh, so. they are. So they've lifted here. They've lifted the, the capacity restriction, except your tables have to be six feet apart. Good. All right. Well, gentlemen, it's been a fantastic start to our evening. So thank you to our listeners. Thank you to this wonderful panel that we have with us today. Brock, Devin, Blair, and Dave, it's been an absolute pleasure spending this first hour with you guys. Uh, we're moving our conversation from the distillery tour to the tasting room, and it's a beautiful one, for a more relaxed but equally engaging conversation. So co-authors Davin and Blair Phillips of... And let's get this book out and take a long breath. The Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries, the portable expert to over 200 distilleries and the spirits they make, will, of course, be joining us. Because what better summer activity is there than traveling virtually and trying some cocktails and spending time with great people? So please join us in about five, ten minutes, somewhere in there on this channel for the After Dram. And if you don't want to miss a minute of our next 10 weeks, please click on the like and subscribe button, and I will see you all very soon. So lift the dram, and cheers, gentlemen. I'll see you very soon. Mine's gone. <laughs> Me too. Empty. <laughs> Stop.